property. It is a pleasure to welcome our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Kira Fitzpatrick, who is well qualified to address this subject. Kira is a lecturer and researcher in law in the Ulster University and a member of the Transitional Justice Institute within the university. She has a first class honours degree in law from the Ulster and during this time she became active in human rights and social justice. She then did a PhD thesis. She researched the increasingly conditional nature of our social security system for the unemployed. Kira's interest in poverty and social justice has continued since her PhD in 2019, and she has progressed her investigations. She is active in her work in all forms of human rights and social justice. She asked me not to labour these, <laughs> but you can take it from me that she is well qualified to talk to us. As an aside, she can be heard on Thought for the Day with Radio Ulster. Following uh, Kira's, Kira's talk, we'll uh, follow our usual breaking into small groups for about 15 minutes and then come together for about 25 minutes for a plenary discussion. We'll then invite Kira to spend a few minutes on closing comments and we'll finish by nine o'clock. She will speak to us on impoverished communities and she then asks the question, political choices. Kira, over to you and thank you very much for coming. People might want to switch to uh, speaker view on uh, in, in Zoom. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really kind introduction, Alan. And I should say that, Alan, um, I was compelled to participate in tonight's talk because Alan so keenly followed up with me and eventually found me on Facebook. So well done to Alan for doing that. And I'm really delighted um, to be here. Um, and the reason that I uh, asked yeah, Alan, the reason I asked Alan to mention that I am a contributor to BBC Radio Ulster's Thought for the Day is because I'm actually going to begin our talk with a recent Thought for the Day um, that I penned. Well, it was February 2024. So this Thought for the Day is in memory of Kenneth and Bronson Battersby. And it's designed to sort of frame the discussion that we will have tonight. It's a tragedy that we'd rather not think about. The mental picture it paints so harrowing that it's hard to believe it could be true. The life taken from a father by heart attack and his little two-year-old son curled up beside him, also dead from suspected dehydration and starvation believed to have been alone for a number of days following the demise of his only carer. This was the distressing fate of single parent Kenneth Battersby and his baby son Bronson. Some have put it down to a failure of social services and police who were unable to gain entry at the home on two separate occasions before the pair were found. Some have put it down to lack of resources I, however, find real potency in working class academic Lisa McKenzie's theory that it speaks to increasing levels of social isolation, particularly in areas like Skegness, where Kenneth and Bronson lived. The vast majority of residents live in severely deprived areas. Deindustrialization, the seasonal economy, and years of austerity coupled with a, a vehement push towards individualism, has decimated community connection. As Mackenzie explains in a previous time, someone would have noticed that something was off. 
that it was peculiar that the last time the father and son were seen on Boxing Day, almost two weeks before they were found. The breakdown of community has become a deep-seated phenomenon requiring funded policies that aim to tackle vast and growing inequality, such as improved housing, better transport links and access to health and education provision. But in the meantime, we can work on nurturing human connections by making an effort to know our neighbours, to check in on them, to foster the love and care that little Bronson Battersby was bereft of in those cold and agonising days in January. Good morning. Good evening, I should say. But that's how I finished it um, on Thought for the Day. But it's a very, very poignant thought for the day, but it really frames the discussion that I want to have with you all tonight um, very firmly, because what I want to talk to you about is how we have moved from an era of collectivism where communities were really strongly bonded together. Uh, there was solidarity. Uh, we looked out for our neighbours. Uh, we made sure that they were they were OK. Um, we sought help if they needed. And I'm not saying that this doesn't happen. It does. But increasingly in communities where there's a very transient population, where there's people moving in and out, we know that less and less houses are being purchased these days. There's a lot of rental properties um, and that leads to a more transient population. People don't keep their house for the entirety of their lives anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we have a diverse, an increasingly diverse population where we have many different nationalities moving in to different communities. And all of this alongside a philosophy of individualism, neoliberalism, has created a situation where we are seeing much deeper social isolation in our communities across this island. And I suppose I'm going to do a bit of a potted history. I'm not going, I don't have all of the details here, but to give sort of a rundown of, of, of what has happened over the last sort of 70 odd years. After World War II, there was a lot of solidarity, particularly in Great Britain. Um, you know, a lot of men uh, were off to war. Uh, there was huge amount of damage done. And we had a Labour government who were really committed to developing a welfare state. And Ireland actually um, really emulated much of what Beveridge committed to in terms of developing the social security system. And at the nub of the social security system was this idea that nobody should be destitute. Nobody should be that impoverished that they aren't able to feed themselves or their family, particularly if they fall into unemployment. And um, if somebody in the household becomes sick, if somebody in the household has a disability, there should always be enough that they should have what was called a modicum of economic stability. Um, and that was a philosopher um, or a theorist that um, I use a lot in my work, T. H. Marshall, and he said that really the golden age of the welfare state, so the 1950s and 60s, this was achieved. We saw growing equality because of the social security system, because of free education um, and compulsory education, and also because of the, the National Health Service and the, the opportunity for people to be in better health. Also the huge campaign of house building as well. We had, we had huge numbers of houses being built. Um, and all of this created less class divides, but it took huge public investment. And in the 1970s, uh, we know that there was a huge period of recession. Um, and actually, uh, the the cost of living crisis, as it's called, um, you know, it, 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 it's sort of the biggest recession since that recession back in the early 1970s. And at that time, a new philosophy began to take hold. And it was really nurtured by Thatcher, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who became prime minister and her contemporaries, um, who believed that people needed to stand on their own two feet. Neoliberalism new liberalism, that people um, would make it 
to the top, this meritocracy, as it's also called, where if you work hard enough, um, if you um, are well educated, that you will succeed in life. And Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s famously said that there is no such thing as society. So this whole idea of a welfare state to wrap around the population has slowly been eroded since the 1970s until now in 2024. And it's become progressively eroded to the point where we have a skeleton welfare state. In terms of social security, we've seen billions of cuts to provision. And I'm sure you're all aware of the latest announcement, which is that the Winter Fuel Alliance is going to be means tested. So really, when, when things are tough, when money is tight, the first thing to be cut is the social security safety net. And that is what happened when we went through those years of austerity. So austerity began in 2010. And up until that point, we seen a tightening of the social security system. And that's what I talked a lot about in my PhD. Um, we looked at increasing conditions attached to receiving social security benefits. So mothers were expected to look for work much sooner. I'll give you an example. Up until about 2012, a mother was able to stay at home and receive tax credits, um, child tax credits until the child was 12 years old. That has now been decreased to the child is three years old in a matter of a few years. So as soon as a child turns one, you have to prove to the government that you are doing what you can to find full-time work. Part-time work's no longer enough. We have what's called in-work conditionality, which means if you're working part-time and you're claiming a state benefit in Great Britain, you're now expected to increase your hours to try and find more work or another job so as you can be completely independent from the welfare state. If you don't evidence that you are doing enough, you will be sanctioned, which means there's a pause in your benefit for a certain amount of time, the maximum amount of time being about three months. Um, and these sanctions have been, uh, they came to sort of a pinnacle in about 2013 and they sort of leveled off, but they're increasing again as um, the government are trying to get people back out to work, particularly after the huge worldwide pandemic. Because what happened after the pandemic is that a lot of people have developed chronic illness, long COVID, and we've seen economic productivity drop. We've seen people who are in ill health. And therefore, rather than looking holistically at what that person might need in terms of healthcare, in terms of mental health support, the government is cracking down with the stick rather than the carrot. And they're increasing, they're increasing sanctions on those people who show that they're not doing enough to get into work. So we're really living in a time where if you fall ill, if someone in your household becomes unemployed, that there no longer is a safety net to rely on. We've seen the introduction of quite pernicious policies um, and I know people in the Republic of Ireland are always quite shocked by this particular policy, but in 2016, the British government introduced what is called a two-child limit. So child support in universal credit, which is the main income replacement benefit in um, Great Britain, um, is limited to the first two children in the household. Mm. So therefore, we see larger families uh, families where there are three or more children becoming even more impoverished. And we're really seeing this child poverty take hold across Great Britain. Child poverty is about 27% in Great Britain. In Northern Ireland, it's getting higher. It was at about 18%. But over those few years of COVID and the cost of living crisis, the most recent statistics suggests that it's gone up to 24%. Mm -hmm. 
That's because of policies such as the two child limit, but also the huge, the huge spike in the cost of our essentials, in the cost of food, in the cost of heating oil, um, in the cost of those things that we need to live from day to day. Uh, colleagues and I did a piece of research with 250 women and their biggest stress and pressure was feeding their children food, the cost of food. 75% of women were really worried about how much their food costs. With some really harrowing quotations from these women, and actually I wish I had pulled out a few um, for, for our talk tonight, but I can give you the gist of a couple. For example, one woman said that their family ate chicken and nuggets and chips five days a week because it was the cheapest thing that they could find in Iceland, which is, you know, a frozen food place. Uh, one woman couldn't afford the increasing price of formula, which has gone up um, 50 percent over uh, the last two years. Um, and she said that, that her heart began to beat faster when she found herself coming to the bottom of the formula tin. Um, and in Northern Ireland, we obviously have a very complex past and that we see, we've seen women being pushed to paramilitary lenders because they're desperate and they don't have the safety of the welfare state, the safety of our social security system. And therefore they're having to revert to dark sources of money. And of course, we know that there are treacherous consequences for those women who are unable to make those payments. So what, what sort of atmosphere or environment has this created for our communities? This individualism, this individualist um, philosophy that has been really pushed throughout our society over the last 50 years has created a lot of divisiveness and division. We see that across Ireland and Northern Ireland recently in working class areas in terms of people who are arriving here as asylum seekers and are looking for a place of sanctuary. And a lot of times they, and more increasingly, they're facing a lot of hatred. And one of the biggest reasons for that is there's this perception that our um, ever depleting resources, our ever depleting safety net, our ever depleting housing stock, our overstretched health system, our overstretched education system is being put under more pressure by new arrivals. And I think one of the frustrating things for, for someone like me, who is constantly campaigning for human rights and social justice is that those people who are frustrated by the state of affairs never seem to look up at the government and their lack of action, but they also, they, all, they look elsewhere for, for blame. And that's what's happening increasingly. Also, as someone who campaigns constantly for strengthened social security safety net to, to, to move back from really, you know, we're below the bronze age of the welfare state at this point, to go back towards that golden age. Um, I obviously get a lot of um, kickback uh, with a lot of people saying, well, if people can't afford to have children, they shouldn't have them. Or why should I pay for somebody else's children? Um, why should my tax go to a disabled person? You know, it, it should, it should, I should be able to maintain my wealth. I shouldn't have to redistribute it to those people who need it. Whereas wealth distribute, redistribution is the key to tackling inequality. We need to see our wealth distributed. Because, okay, you may not want to pay to feed somebody else's children, but we need to look at the bigger picture is what I often say. Those children are going to be the taxpayers of the future. They are going to be our future politicians, our future nurses and doctors. And if they do not get the, the best start in life, we're go they're not going to reach their full potential. And actually a recent Northern Ireland audit report said that child poverty is costing us 800 million to 1 billion pounds per year. And that's because 
those children are not succeeding in their GCSEs. The biggest indication of educational underachievement is those children who are in free school meals, those children who are living in poverty. Those children may need more intervention for so from social services. Those children may end up as more putting more pressure on our prison system. Those children may end up more likely to need hospital attention and are putting more pressure on the NHS. So in many ways, it's a false economy not to tackle child poverty. And in the round, the Republic of Ireland are doing much better in this respect. And they recognise the value of children and the value of protecting our children from the worst ravages of poverty. I think the poverty level in the Republic of Ireland off the top of my head is sitting around 12 to 14 percent. So it's a lot considerably lower. Um, the level of child benefit is considerably higher. And um, uh, obviously it's making a huge difference in, in, in terms of what the statistics are telling us. So what has happened? What has filled this void? And this is sort of what I want to finish, in, finish on because of late I've been having a lot of interesting conversations, particularly with a new group um, that has... Uh, is establishing itself in Northern Ireland called the Christian Coalition Against the Christian Coalition of Voices Against Poverty. So what's happened is that a lot of Christian communities are trying to fill the void, but finding it very difficult. And they're doing this. I know this is more common in Northern Ireland, maybe increasingly common in the Republic of Ireland through food charity, food banks. So we now have over 60 food banks in Northern Ireland that are providing those people who do not have enough money to purchase food with groceries for the week. Um, and really my question is, is this letting the government off with the many cuts that they're making, putting the weight of responsibility on the Christian community to provide charitable provision because many of these food banks are connected to churches. So we're going back to a time pre-welfare state where charitable provision is really a mainstay of providing people with a social safety net. Because we have food banks now, we have baby banks, um, we have heat banks where people can go if their houses are cold to stay warm. And in one sense, this has the potential to create more community ties. But in the other sense, it creates quite a bit of stigma because people don't have the autonomy to choose what food they want to purchase. Social security has always been um, a direct, a cash first um, directive where people receive the cash into their bank accounts or they were able to go to the post office and pick up their money and, and they were able to decide how to spend it. Whereas the charitable provision that's filling the gaps is based on people not having the breadth of choice that they ought to have. So many food banks can't cater for dietary requirements, for religious conviction, um, and for some people that would just rather have a different brand of coffee, which has now become a luxury for people who are sick, disabled, unemployed, single parents um, and trying to live best they can. So I'm going to really wrap up there. I am going to end with a call to action. I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to speak to you all this evening because um, we are trying to, I, I am a campaigner for a, an organization called, or a group called the Cliff Edge Coalition. It's totally voluntary and it's over 130 um, community sector organizations in Northern Ireland. Also part of the All Island um, Social Security Network where we're trying to make connections between the North and the South with a view to developing a better social security system across the island. Um, and also the Christian Coalition for Voices Against Poverty. And, and really what we're trying to do there is 
to empower the Christian community to go beyond charitable provision and to actually have the confidence and um, the conviction to speak to our political leaders and say, no, this isn't good enough. You know, we can't bear this responsibility on our shoulders. It's about time the government stepped up and provided people with a sufficient income to have the dignity of getting by and not to be living in increasing poverty and destitution. So thank you so much, everybody.